after Friday night, I was looking back on this, and so many of the things that I had down on here just felt so insignificant. The whatever commentary I had written down or things that I had added, and my brain was just completely frazzled. Still is. And after talking to some people yesterday, I realized that there is still things I can get out of it that I hope help everyone here, or that everyone's able to get something out of this. So we're currently going through the Ablaze 25, uh, and what I'm talking about today is going to be about servant leadership. We've been exposed to a lot of different leaders in the world. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Whether it be you know things you see on the news, or teachers, or mentors, or our parents, things like that. And after Friday night, uh, we got pointed out that there were a lot of examples of servant leadership there that I could definitely use today. So first up is going to be Matthew. 20, 25 through 28. Uh, I'm going to read it here. You guys can read along if you want. Uh, Jesus called them together and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and that their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom of many. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I can definitely think of people in my life who fit both of these, who fit the Gentiles who just like to flex their authority as a position of leadership, and then those people who have done the opposite and have demonstrated what it means to be a servant leader in this aspect. But the first thing I want to talk about is why. Like, why do we even bother with this? What, why, did, why should we change it up, as they say? And the reason that I found was in Acts 1-8. Uh, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the primary mission that we have is to be God's witnesses, to reach other people, to reach the lost people, to show them what we have found, and to share Christ with them, essentially. That is the point here. And servant leadership, at least from, what, from the things that I've experienced, have very, has a very deep, profound impact on people when they run into it. So just to kind of help with this, I spent some time thinking about, okay, what does a non-servant leadership look like? You know, what, what, do they, what do they consider important? So for, I guess we should say, this world version of leadership, there's the mission. There's the goal, the task that comes first. Then it's yourself. Because you're the leader, you're like in charge, you're here to make sure that the mission is accomplished. That is the priority. And then after that, the last thing is the people under you. The people who are your subordinates, the people who follow you, the people who you're in charge of. I've seen lots of leaders who are just, you see them as tools to get to the main goal, to get that mission done, to get what they needed done, and that's basically it. However, what Jesus did and what he talks about in Matthew completely flips it on its head, where with servant leadership, instead it's the people come first. At least with us as Christians, the people and the mission are almost the same thing. The lost are our mission here. That's what he wants us to focus on. And at the bottom is ourselves. Not that taking ourselves isn't important, but 
when it comes, when you're in a position of leadership, when you're trying to follow the example that Christ said, you're, and I've done this a lot of times, you're often the last person you think about. So now that we kind of understand the hierarchy of what you know, servant leaders look as important, I want to touch on a few points that are characteristics that accentuate the servant leadership. And the first thing is humility. Proverbs 18, 12, before a, a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. And as I was reading through the Bible, there, basically I could fit literally the entire life of Jesus in this one piece here, honestly, for the whole thing. Uh, but there's a saying that we have in the court, maybe it's common, but I hear a lot, at least in a military environment, where it's leading from the front. What that basically means is that you are on the ground with them, with the people you're leading. It is very easy to delegate or sit back or sit in a com comfortable area and just give out orders and get people to do that job for you. But with a servant leader, I've seen many people go out of their way to put themselves outside of that comfort zone that they're in, to be with their followers, to be with the people who are there leading, regardless of how messy it gets, or how dirty it gets, or how hard it is. And there are so many examples of Jesus doing this in Luke 5, 12, where Jesus heals man with leprosy. In Luke 8, 40 through 54, Jesus raising a dead girl and healing a sick woman. In Luke 9, he heals a possessed boy. The Son of Man, who is also God, was down there, down here on earth, walking around with his own two feet. He could have definitely just probably teleported himself wherever he wanted to go, but he opted not to. And he went around and he saw the worst of what was here to see it firsthand. When, when everything started Friday night, and uh, initially I thought that you know it was like a false alarm, you know, nothing would happen. And then when we got the notification that gunshots were being fired, I was like, okay, this is real. In the core, normally there is an RA for each floor. There are five floors in the core dorms, and there are five RAs. That night there was only two of them who are basically our commanding officers, if you would say. And they had to go around and get accountability for hundreds of people within the span of a couple minutes because they were the only ones who could. And I was there, I was helping them I, door to door we went to make sure that people were okay, that they were here. And if we didn't know where they were, we were doing everything we could to find them. But they could have just as easily have delegated a bunch of people to just do it themselves and report back. But they physically went through the effort of checking every single room in, in five floors in the corridor when they didn't have to. Another person that got to me was Luke 4, when Jesus was tested in the wilderness, where he was out there for 40 days and 40 nights, hungry and tired, I can imagine, when Satan came to tempt him. And what struck me was that he chose to do that. There was, from whatever, I didn't see any like prompt for it. He just decided, you know what, I'm going to go and do this. So God could experience the things that we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis 
and really push it to the limit. He didn't have to. He could really just like been like, I'm not hungry, and then he's not hungry. And then he just he was fine. But he willingly put himself through that. Which I think is a one of the characteristics of a servant leadership, of a servant leader. They willingly put themselves through such hard things when they don't have to. When it'll be so much easier not to. Next thing I have on here is listening. In Proverbs 18.13 says, To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. I didn't realize until I first came to a blaze how much it mattered to have a leader who actively listened. who heard whatever it is they had to say, who didn't, you know, try and, you know, automatically fix things, make things better immediately, or cut you off when you're trying to explain what you're going through. They just sat there and listened. I remember when I came to a, first came to a blaze my freshman year, I had a ton of baggage that I carried with me, and I had done that for other people, but I'd never had it done for myself. Where I had just someone listen to everything that I had on my chest. We had people trapped in downtown Friday night. We were getting an ability. We figured out that people were unaccounted for. And then we figured out we were getting text messages from them that they were trapped in the basement of the bars or wherever they were, just barricaded in there and they couldn't leave. And then it only got worse when we, when we learned that one of our own had gotten shot in the lounge when it was attacked. Two people were down there. One of our sophomores had gotten hit, and the other one, who was basically his best friend, watched it happen. He wasn't hurt, but he was there the entire time. He saw it from beginning to end. He watched the person next to him die. That one death that was on the news, he was there. He saw it. And we couldn't do anything. And at some point, because none of us were really going to sleep, he made it back to the dorms. Our other sophomore was rushed to the hospital. He was okay. Well, physically anyway. And all the leadership that was there, we just sat with him in the hallway and listened to him. Because he, as he told us what happened. I'm sure he's, if I'm feeling this way, I can't imagine how he's feeling. But just the fact that he had people around to just listen to him, and we didn't comment because it wasn't really anything to comment. We weren't trying to make it better because we knew it wasn't. I'm sure that made a world of difference if he just came back and no one was, no one was waiting for him, if there was no one there. The last piece I have on here is sacrifice. In John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is something that was made very obvious to me that uh, night where several of us couldn't sleep. We didn't want to sleep. Eventually, we all had to because we were exhausted, but one of our uh, exos, our second-in-command, essentially, 
didn't sleep at all. She didn't go to sleep until everyone was back in the dorms, and they, until they had made it back. And I admire her rate for that. I wish she wouldn't run herself to the bone, but I admire that greatly. And for the rest of us, to put it in a maybe less intense version, sacrifice doesn't have to mean your life or something as intense as that. It can just be your time. Because time is valuable. And the fact that you would give it for someone else means the world to people. There's an inherent part here and kind of coming back to what I talked about in terms of the hierarchy of importance where you put yourself last is that you're putting others before yourself, essentially. Or you're basically the last person to think about. And that's how we were all feeling. That entire time, I was terrified. I was just, when we heard that they were on alumni, which is right in front of the core dorms, I was just sitting there waiting to hear glass break, because the doors to the core dorms are just glass. That's it. There's nothing stopping anyone from going in there if they really wanted to. And as much as I was scared for myself, the only thing I could think about was everyone else, including the people in this room. I may have been scared for my own life, but the thought of anyone else, anyone in here being in danger terrified me more. Just because, like when I heard they'd made it to the edge, that they had been knocking on door pretending to be police, that they had carjacked something, and then rumors were flying around of how many there were. All I could think about was the people who were on campus, the people who were in different apartment complexes, what if they had gone over there? And selfishly, maybe I would prefer that they would just stay near me, 100%. Maybe it's a selfish thing, I don't know. But I'd rather that than have my friends be in danger which I was praying a lot about, but that I think that kind of mentality is something that we do need, that the world needs a lot more of. People who worry about themselves last, who are worried about everyone else. And that's the kind of leadership that I saw in the core that night. It probably was much safer to stay in the rooms, but all the higher leadership, we stayed, at least towards the end, in the hallways to make sure that nothing came in. Because I'd rather, rather at least attempt to protect the people in my company who I consider my family than sit by and not do anything. So, I've had a lot of time to think about this. To be totally frank, I'm not okay. I don't think I will be for a bit. That's okay. I'll just have to go through the motions of it, I think. But, something that got put on my heart that it is moments like this that you really have to show what kind of leader you are. Maybe it doesn't have to be that intense. Maybe it's not something like this where, you know, the campus is in danger or your friends are in danger. But I'm sure there's going to be moments where you're put in a tough spot and you have to make a choice what kind of leader you want to be. The one that thinks about yourself first or the one that thinks about other people first. Because Jesus calls us to push that mold. 
that entire passage in Matthew, what was it? In Matthew 20 through 25, that was such an evolutionary model of what leadership looks like. That's the thing that events like these really test us in. There was a study we talked about uh, in our Bible group a lot of times that the I word this people say they will do a lot of things in a situation, but when it actually happens, is when you see the kind of person you really are. So if anything, that's what I want to leave you guys with. When you're faced with that tough situation, how are you going to respond?